Man, that gets you, gets you feeling victorious, doesn't it? Feel like you could tear something down or build something up. Amen. Well, it's good to be back with, uh, with you, Vine Fellowship. You're looking good. Yeah. Come on, give yourself a big round of applause. Great to be back. Good to be with you wherever you are, watch those who are watching online. Well, you can, find, you can find Luke chapter 1. We'll eventually get there. Luke chapter 1. Uh, let, me, let me ask a question, just kind of take a poll here. Um, how many of you uh, will eat or you like cold pizza? Just lift your hand. Okay. All right. Keep your hand raised for just a minute. How many of you will eat cold pizza for breakfast? Okay. All right. I feel like this is one of those ways that the world is divided. Those who eat cold pizza for breakfast and those who will not. Okay. For those of you who have to have it warmed up, you know, some people have never thought about that. That could be breakthrough. Could be a breakthrough moment right now that you've never thought about eating cold pizza. I think that's just one of the funny ways that maybe uh, life kind of divides us. I mean, some people like fish. Some people, well, everybody likes Mexican food, I think. Some people don't like fish. But the fact of the matter is, those little things that uh, are, are preferences for us, things that we like, this day and age seems like there's a lot of people with, uh, with allergies and they require special, you know, diets, that type of thing. All those little identifiers help to, to uh, become part of our identity. And we're going to be talking over the next several weeks about identity, our identification with Christ. But I want to I talk this morning about what's in a name. Because God has a habit of, like, not only naming people, but a lot of times in Scripture we'll see that he changed people's names. Yeah, and, and there, there someday you'll have a new name that God will give you. And he's probably already calling you that. And it might not be what you're calling yourself. But the fact is people can be divided in a lot of, a, a lot of different ways. But there's just a few things that you think, when you think about it, that really identify you from all the other eight or nine billion people in the world. Can you, can you think of what some of those things might be? The things that identify you as a unique individual. I think one of, the, one of the big ones, because maybe all of the detective shows, the, one of the first things that comes up anymore is your DNA. Okay, your DNA. And maybe your, maybe your fingerprints, right? Your fingerprints are unique to you. And if you watch any, any kind of spy movies, you know, they're always going up to a door and sticking their eye up there and they're doing a what? Retina scan. So those things are unique to us. Well, back in the day, one of the primary things that identified you, one of the things was, was not your name because there could be a lot of Mary Smiths or people with your name. But one of the things, one of the primary ways that we identified you as separate from all the other individuals in the world was your address. Not your web address, they didn't have those back in the day where I'm talking about, but just your address. Because there might have been a thousand Mary Smiths or Steves or Joes or who, whatever your name is, and they might have even had your last name. But nobody but you and your immediate family had your address. And I'm so thankful today we can know, we can know not only the address we live in right now, but we can know, praise God, we can know our permanent address. Hallelujah. We can know that we know that heaven's going to be our permanent address. So those are some things that separate us, uh, and, and they, they kind of inform our identity. But one of the things that directly, that directly informs personality appears to be our name. In other words, your name is one of the things that you hang your identity on. As a matter of fact, as far back as, as 1961, there was research that indicated, in fact, the most important anchorage, to quote Gordon Alport, the most important anchorage to our self-identity throughout life remains our own name. So 
there doesn't seem to necessarily be a direct correlation between your name and the per, your personality, but your name affects how other people view you, which in turn affects your own identity and your personality. I say, what in the world are you talking about? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll get home. I just want to give you a little bit of introduction to the whole series we're going to do, and then we'll jump into today, what's in a name. But the, here's an interesting thing about names. There is a disproportionately higher number of the people with the name Dennis who become dentists. You can kind of figure that one out, Right? Dennis kind of sounds like Dennis, but the thing that we don't understand is there's also a disproportionate number of those people who become lawyers. So we're not sure about it. And there's even, there's even a field of study that has to do with names and with the effect that names have on people. Let me, let me, let me try to remember how to pronounce it. No, I won't even give it a try. So we have, we have things that help us with our self-identity. As, as a Christian, as a believer, obviously, when Jesus becomes Lord of your life, you create some identity within that. But a, a self-identity is the label that you apply yourself. It, it a lot of times comes from your gender, your background, your family, your ethnicity, the region you come from helps us form identity. But our group identity, which I would liken to the church, this church has a group identity, right? Okay. Other groups you're a part of have an identity. And they're formed around the qualities, the values that we have, those things that we share in common. The expressions even that characterize our group. I don't know, your family may have words that, uh, that no other family has. I mean, we have a few of those. And we have some sayings. It's like when, when Cole, our son who's here this morning, was little, uh, you know, I, I, can see, I can see the difficulty in learning English and thinking about our kids just getting language. And he wouldn't say, he wouldn't say that uh, hot chocolate would warm you up. He would say hot chocolate will warm you off. Okay? So we still say, oh, man, that warms me off. Okay, well, that's unique to our family. There's something about our family identity, the things that we do, the traditions that we have at holidays. That's part of our group identity. So I have a self-identity and I have a group identity. And someone has said, and I believe, it, I believe it to be true, that you as an individual believer cannot really find the will of God for your life outside of or without reference to your group identity. Got real quiet there. Either you're thinking about that or it wasn't real clear. Your identity, your self-identity, your individual identity, and the will of God for you individually really only makes sense with, within the arena of the corporate church identity. In other words, if you ever stop and think about it, the New Testament was mainly written to church congregations not to individuals. So the church is important. Us having a self-identity in Christ, a good self-identity that's developed from how God loves us and what he thinks about us is important. But it's also important to understand that our self-identity exists within our group identity. So believers are not isolated. Believers are a part of a group called the church. Amen? So now let me throw, let me throw out, this is, this is a $5 term. Okay, so you don't have to remember this, you don't have to know it, but there's also a theological term known as identification. Okay, identification has to do with the fact that God sees us in Christ. That he, that God has so identified you, the individual believer, with Christ that he sees you merged together. And in fact, in Paul's writings, we find out that God considers you to be one spirit with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that just, that just absolutely blows my thinking out of the water. That somehow God so identifies us with Christ that whatever happened to Christ, God sees as having happened to you. 
You follow me? So in other words, when Jesus was crucified, God sees that you were crucified in him. When he was buried, God identifies you with that burial. When he raised from the dead, God sees you as having been raised from the dead. When Jesus ascended to heaven, he sees you as having been ascended to heaven. And when Christ was seated at the throne, the right hand of God in the place of authority, God in his identification of you with Jesus sees you as seated in a place of authority. So here's, here it is in a nutshell. Identification means that Jesus not, did not just die for you, he died as you. Is that clear? He didn't just die for us, that, that dying for us purchased our salvation. But his dying as you paid a price for your individual unique sins. And when he did that, we'll look into this a little further in the weeks ahead, that that blood applied is a perpetual application and that he in that one sacrifice removed sin once for all. So if the enemy, I'll just give you a little application here, but if the enemy comes and he's constantly reminding you of your past and things that you did in the past and your failures, You'll have to understand that there's somebody, the enemy, who has a vested interest in you identifying with something that's been done away with once for all. He didn't just die for us, he died as us. When he went to that cross, I went to that cross. When he was crucified, you were crucified. So in God's eyes, whatever happened to Jesus, happened to you. Matter of fact, let me, let me flip over here to Colossians real quick. Yes, there's my, it's time to change scripture mode. I know we're not at the text yet, but I'm, I'm, I just feel like this is something we got to read. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12 says it this way. I got to find out where to jump in here. Glory to God. Yeah, let's look at verse 21. You who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled. Verse 22, in the body in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. To present you holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. Now, look this way for just a second. Now, don't raise your hand because we don't want everybody to know. But is, is that a thought you have about yourself? That in his sight, you're holy, blameless, and above reproach? Is that the way you think about yourself? Is that the way you identify yourself in Christ? If not, then we need some work on renewing our minds. Now, we won't, we won't go on to read this, but in Colossians, it talks about how we were buried with him and we were raised with him to newness of life. Christ died for us. It's a substitutionary sacrifice. We died with Christ. That's our identification with him. We died with him. And as a matter of fact, the more we renew our minds to truths like we just read from Colossians, the more we renew our minds to the fact that we are in Christ and were in Christ at the resurrection, that our unique individual sins, not just sin in general, that was taken care of too at the cross. We'll talk about that in the subsequent weeks. But the fact of the matter is, I have to begin to identify with what God says I am and who he says I am. He said this about Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you and I appointed you a prophet to the nations. 
I love, I love the Psalm, Psalm 139 talks about how that every day of your life was recorded or written down before you were ever formed in your mother's womb. And everything he ever wrote about you, he wrote reflected through the blood of Jesus and through the cross of Christ. In other words, he doesn't have any plans for your failure. He has plans for your blessing. Okay, he doesn't have any plans for confusion. He has plans for direction. And any time I come into a situation that's contrary to what God's word says, it's important that I go back to my identification in him. Because I'll make some, I'll make some bum decisions. I'll do some dumb stuff sometime. But the fact of the matter is, my life is hid with Christ in God. And as long as I stay there, he sees me as perfect, he sees me as blameless, he sees me as above reproach. Now let's, let's talk for a couple of minutes about the naming of John, John the Baptist. You remember this story? This is a, this is a forgotten part, I, I say forgotten, you'll understand what I mean, but it's kind of a forgotten part of the Christmas story. Because prior to Jesus' birth, he had a cousin that was born whose name was John, and it was so supernatural what took place in the lives. But let's just get a quick a quick look. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but I'm going to read a few parts of it. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 1 verse 5, there was in the days of Herod the king of Judah a certain priest named Zacharias. We're talking about what's in a name, and I just found it really interesting that there's so much talk about names in this first uh, verse that we're reading. There's a certain priest named Zacharias. Zacharias means God remembers. He was of the division of Abijah. That's identification. I'm sure part of his self-identity. He was of the division of Abijah. That's a division of priests. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron. So that's, a, that's, that's some pretty high identity right there. Aaron, the initial chief priest. She was one of the daughters of Aaron. His wife was one of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. A whole lot of naming going on here. And watch this. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. That's a nice way to put that, isn't it? it did, he didn't say these were old folks. He said they were advanced in years. Okay, nice way to put that. A lot of emotional intelligence going on right here, Dr. Luke. So the, the point is this. He gives us the names, gives us part of the identity, and then says this couple who's believing God for a child didn't have a child. You know, we don't always get what we want when we want it. Thank you, honey. I guess maybe, maybe everybody here at Vine Fellowship gets everything you pray for immediately. I mean, that, thank God when that happens. But if we got everything we wanted right when we wanted it or thought we needed it, where would, where would patience come in? See, it's by faith and patience that we inherit the promises. Better get off that. Yeah. They were advanced in years. I wonder if that had settled into their identity. Well, we're just we're just childless. Elizabeth is barren, but apparently there was some praying going on. Because it came time for Zechariah to be the guy who got to burn the incense inside the inside the temple. So when it came time for him to go in, he goes in, people are outside praying. Apparently, you know, they knew pretty much how long this is supposed to take, kind of like people expect. They know how long the preacher's going to preach, you know. And so he goes in and he doesn't come out and there you can tell people are getting a little antsy. He doesn't come out and an angel appears to him and says, Zechariah, don't be afraid. He says, because your prayer has been 
been heard, and your wife Elizabeth is going to bear you a son, and you will call his name John. Now, this is important stuff, right? He's in there doing his priestly duty, and he has an encounter with an angel. That's a big deal. You know, it kind of troubles me when people claim to have visions and dreams, and they are not troubled by that. Because any time in Scripture somebody sees an angel, the angel's always like, don't be freaked out. Stay with me. Don't be afraid. Why is that? I mean, when somebody just poof, appears right in your presence, I think that would be a little bit startling. I mean, I get startled when my wife just appears in the same room unannounced and says something. So the angel says, you're going to have a son. Your prayer has been answered. And then the angel says, I love this because it's like giving the answer before the quiz. The angel says to him, you will have joy and gladness, right? You'll have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth because this kid's going to be great before the Lord. And so if you know the story, you know the opposite happens. Basically, Zechariah says to the angel, how do you expect me to believe that we're going to have kids at our age? And I'm sure he didn't say because we're well advanced in years. He was probably saying because we's old folks. All the baby boomers said amen. You're going to have joy and gladness. Well, Zechariah didn't display that. He fails the pop quiz even though the angel gave him the results. And, and, and Zechariah says to the angel, how can I know this? I'm an old man. And the angel said, now watch this, you, you, you got to read, you got to read the Bible for all it's worth. The angel tells him his response is going to be joy and gladness. This is going to be awesome, dude. You've been praying for this and it's finally here. And I can understand at whatever age Zacharias is, he's probably thinking about changing diapers and putting this kid in pre-K and basketball. Where in the world are we going to find the energy for this? You know, it's like, you're, it's like when your grandkids show up, you're excited about it, but then you're equally excited when they leave because you wore out. Now you know why you had kids when you were young. I don't know, somebody here might be raising your grandkids. God bless you with extra energy. But the fact of the matter is, he does not respond like, a, like Gabriel respond, uh, told him to respond. And in fact, that's the thing I, I'm saying, you have to kind of watch this. Because prior to this moment, the angel is just described as an angel, just another messenger. And then when Zechariah does not respond correctly, then the angel pulls rank and says, hey, I'm Gabriel. I'm not just another messenger angel. I'm one of the top guys sent to you because we got this good news and you're going to rejoice, but you didn't rejoice. So here's the deal, Zechariah. I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I was sent to speak, speak to you and bring you this. Watch good news. And behold, you're going to be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things Things, these things take place because you did not believe my words. Why could he not speak until John was born? Because he did not believe the word of the Lord. So let's, ca let's catch up and get back down here. Let's go all the way over to verse 57. Now, when the time full time came for her to be delivered, she brought forth a son. Hmm. That's just what the angel said was going to happen. When her neighbors and relatives heard how the Lord had shown great mercy to her. You, you notice anything interesting about that passage? It says nothing about Zechariah, does it? Apparently he's still not rejoicing. He's still not in a good mood. He's had nine months to think about this. Maybe he needs some kind of jolt into reality. But her neighbors and her, her relatives heard, and they came around and rejoiced with her, just like the angel said that would. So it was on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child. 
And they would have called him by the name of his father. Who's this? The friends, the neighbors, the relatives. Everybody has an opinion about what you should do. You ever notice that? If, you're, if you've got kids, everybody's got a vision for your kids. But what does God say? So they, the neighbors, relatives, and friends would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias. His mother answered and said, no. Just say that with me. It feels good. Just say it. No. Come on, say it again because some of y'all were hesitant. Everybody say it together. No. You know, sometimes that does need to be our response. It's like when the devil starts talking about your situation, how it's never going to get any better, and it's you waited too long for this to come to pass. I mean, faith and patience. Sometimes you just need to tell the devil, no. Sometimes you need to tell people who ask you uh, to do some stuff that's not in your heart to do. You just need to simply say, see, some of y'all are still having a hard time with that. No is a complete sentence. You've heard that, right? No is a complete sentence. No, Elizabeth says, he shall be called John. Sounds like somebody believed the identity that God had given this kid. Verse 61, but, but they said to her, there is no one among your relatives who's called by this name. See, they've got some reasons. They've got some backup. What is it? It's tradition that we name the kids after the father. But there is no one among your relatives who is called by this name. Verse 62, so they made signs to his father. This is, I think this just cracks me up. He is not deaf, he's mute. But sounds like some identity has been changing. He's got some identity with this group who are now signing to him like they can't, like he can't hear them. So they made signs to the father what he would have him called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote saying, his name is John. So they all marveled. And watch what happens. Immediately his mouth was open. So after these nine months or whatever it is, he writes in agreement with what God has called John. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue was loose and he spoke praising God. So he does in that moment what he should have done initially. And then you can go on to see he, he delivers a prophetic word over the nation. He's, he's starting to prophesy over John and kind of fill in the blanks of, you know what? Initially, he could have had the same response. and We would have had a different story. But the fact of the matter is, I love this. He couldn't speak it, but he did what he could. He grabbed that tablet and he wrote it out. His name is John. Finally agreeing with what God had said. And the miracle took place in that moment. Come on, somebody. Your miracle can take place in a moment. Hey, it can happen in a day. What you've been proclaiming, what you've been believing God for, it can happen in a day. You can't let delay knock you off your horse. You've got to keep believing God, keep trusting him. So, Zechariah couldn't speak until he called his son what God called his son. This was, not, this was not punishment. Him not being able to speak was not punishment, but it was protection for John. Because while Zechariah was still in a place of unbelief, whatever he said would carry authority. You know, we've been given authority in this earth. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 28. Let's create man in our image and let them have dominion over everything that's created. And then he tells Adam, God tells Adam, uh, hey, be fruitful, multiply, and take dominion. Man, that's powerful. That's powerful. Psalms, the psalmist talks about this. What is man that you're mindful of him? You've made him a little lower than Elohim, 
and that you have crowned him with glory and honor and you have placed everything under his dominion. You were created for dominion. Adam was created for dominion. And if you think about this in terms of the Bible story, Genesis, Adam lost that dominion and authority. And the whole story of the Bible is that second Adam coming and coming on the scene and restoring to you everything that the first Adam lost for you, but restoring to you that dominion, that righteousness, the ability to stand before the presence of God with no sense of guilt, no sense of condemnation, no sense of inferiority. Thank you. Come on, somebody. Y'all need to watch out. If you, if you encourage me, I'll be preaching better. People start getting healed, raised from the dead. The poor will prosper. And then it's just work, work, work after that because people start coming to church. They start bringing people. The aisles are crowded. We have to put out extra seats. It's just work, work, work. So please don't, don't go encouraging me too much. So let me, let me quickly give you three things that I feel like are applications out of this. Three things. Everybody say three things. The first is this. I just labeled this contradiction. Sometimes you have to go against the flow. Everybody in the, in the office is complaining about this thing, that person, your family, you call them up, all they want to do is gripe about the rest of the family. And let me give you news, if they're doing that, when they call the next person, they're griping about you. But the fact of the matter is, you can contradict, you can speak up. This is what I like about Elizabeth, when everybody, her friends and her family were saying, no, this is the traditional thing to do, this is what you ought to be doing. She simply stood up and said, no. His name is John. I'm calling my son what God called him. He's a miracle baby already. Why would I name him what I want to name him? He's going to do what God called him to do. He's going to have everything God called him to have. And he's going to accomplish what God designed him to accomplish. Why would I call him anything else? John, meaning God's gracious gift. I mean, I know the sense that his dad's name, God remembers, could be good because God remembers his covenant. He remembers his word. But that could also have a negative connotation. Oh, God knows all that stuff you did. God knows all that stuff you think. God, hey, God remembering his word is one thing, but God does not remember our sin against us. And I think, I'm, I'm thankful she stood up. She spoke up. You know, sometimes we just need to go against the flow. That just feels good to say that. No one in your family has that name. You know that tone? You can just hear, you can just hear it. You can't do that. It's like even if it's not registering on the outside, you can sense that's on the inside. It's like contradict. Think about this. Just think contra, against, dick, shun. Say against. Listen, if the enemy's bringing lies, if he's bringing fear, if he's saying you can't make it, if he's saying it's not going to work out, you got to stand up and say, no, I have to contradict. I have to speak against that. Speak up if it contradicts God's will. Okay, we're getting some traction in here. I heard that come on. Speak up if it doesn't. Go along with what God says about you. Speak up. Contradiction. Romans 12 says, stop imitating the ideals and the opinions of the culture around you. You know what? Sometimes you just got to speak up. You know, where is the faith if our mindset is totally consumed with complaining, totally consumed with the negative, consumed with thinking about what we don't have? Where is faith if, if your whole mindset is impregnated with hopelessness. See, God's word changes everything. His word changes everything. When you believe God's word in your heart, you'll eventually change what you're speaking. 
I mean, think about that monitor. If we, if we could record your words and maybe your thoughts, how many of those words and thoughts line up with what God says we have and how many of it just lines up with what naturally we can see? I mean, I don't have time to, to do a, a word study with you today about this, but Jesus did say in Mark chapter 11, you can have what you say. But most of God's people are saying what they have. Not what God's word says. So if we hear something that's fueling hopelessness, then we got to come on, we got to rise up and speak against. Number two, number one was contradict. We got to go, be willing to go against the flow. But number two is confession. God's word has to be elevated above our thoughts and above our experience. See, what a lot of Christians want to do is that they want to bring God's word down to the level of what they've experienced. Because I'll, I'll be the first to tell you, I'm not batting a thousand yet where prayers are concerned. There are prayers that take time to be answered. And I'm convinced that there are some prayers we're praying that won't take effect until later down, generations that we'll probably never know. Personally, this side of heaven. But I also understand this. I need to be speaking God's words and elevating God's words. Because he said, Isaiah 55, my, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. I need to be like, like Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and following, not leaning on my own understanding, but acknowledging God in all my ways. Because his ways are higher. He knows more than I. This, I, I would fit this next verse into every message I preach if I could do it. Psalm 119, 128. Therefore, I esteem all your precepts concerning all things to be right. Did you get that? I consider the word of God to be right about all things. Whatever it is, whatever you say, I consider that to be right regardless of what I'm experiencing, regarding of what my track record says, regarding of what the news is forecasting. I mean, we're in that cycle in the election period where you hear so much junk. Everybody's slinging mud. And I'll just tell you this, everybody's lying to some degree to try to make themselves look better by putting the other candidates down. There comes a time when we just need to declare this is truth. I believe this to be right above everything else. <coughs> Amen. Thank you, honey. Yeah, I'm trying. See, words are powerful. Words carry authority because you've been given authority. You got to choose your words carefully. You got to aim your words carefully. Choose carefully what you call yourself. Choose carefully what you call your family, your kids. Choose carefully what you call your church. Choose to speak what God says about your situation. No, his name shall be called John. Now, here's here's the third thing, and I think this is this is consistent. How long have I been preaching? Fifteen minutes. <clears throat> okay. My remaining hour, I'll close. Yeah, I just want to encourage you because this is. What I'm talking about today, this position of authority, that's yours when you choose to step into it. Nothing in the Christian life is based. Our authority, our healing, 
our standing with God, none of it is based on our performance. It's all based on Jesus' performance. And he did bat a thousand. He did walk it out perfectly. There was no failure. He was tempted like we are, yet without sin. So he defeated the devil. He defeated the grave. He walked as a prototype, as an example of the kind of person you and I should be developing in. Mm -mm -mm. So consistency. Number three, consistency. We've got to consistently, it's not just about thinking or meditating one scripture one time. We have so much garbage filter through our minds, so many negative words spoken over us, so much negative self-talk. You've got to, it's like you've got a mega dose on God's word even to get back up to level. It's the washing of the water of the word. My mind is cleansed and my mind is renewed. You know, what I have, who, who I am, what I have in Christ, what I can do in Christ. I mean, it's, it's like we want to we wanna come for 30 minutes on a Sunday morning and get something that helps and changes us. That's good, but consistency. I mean, even taking one passage of scripture or one verse and consistently thinking about it. The Old Testament word meditate means to mutter, speak it to yourself. I mean, there's something about, there's something about, and God is able to make all grace come to me in abundance so that I may always, under all circumstances and whatever the need be self-sufficient. There's a, when you walk consistently, whatever it is, I'm with his stripes, I am healed. Whatever it is you fight in here and you begin to, you begin to meditate it, you begin to mutter it, you consistently begin to say what God's word says over what you think or feel. Something is going to take place on the inside of you and pretty soon something's going to get traction and things are going to begin to change outside of you just like they change inside of you. Who you are in Christ is powerful. Who you are in Christ is whole is redeemed, is forgiven, is a person of authority. But consistency in, in feeding that to your spirit changes things. Now, we, we live in a culture that's caught up with transparency and about being authentic and being real, so much so that aspirational goals, those things that we aspire to be, those things we aspire to do can seem less than real, but it really depends on what culture you are more influenced by. Are you more influenced by the culture of heaven, the unseen powerful realm of God, or are you more influenced by what you can see, what you can handle, what news media or other people say about you? Because you're always going to manifest, you're always going to manifest that culture that you're most aware of. You're more aware of heaven. You're more aware of God's promises. You're going to manifest that around you. But if what you are clearly thinking about, muttering to yourself, complaining about, or fearing about, is the, if that's the main input to your life, guess what? You're not going to manifest order. You'll begin to manifest chaos. God forbid. The point is you don't have to. You can choose what you think about. You can choose what you talk about. Heavenly or earthly. Now, here, here's where a lot of people get messed up with the whole, I, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. My sins are forgiven. All my sins, past, present, and future are forgiven. But where, where me being a new creature messes with some people's thinking is because they think that's, that they are their body. Look at me right here. You are not your body. That's news to a lot of people because their whole identity is caught up in their appearance. You're a spirit who has a soul who lives in a body. We'll talk, that's actually next week. I hope to get into that next week. So I won't say much more about that. But what's true about you being a new creature right now, about every sin being forgiven right now, about you being 100% wall to wall, Holy Ghost, just like Jesus right now, that's true in your spirit. 
We have to work that into our minds and our bodies. But it's true right now. I just have to learn how to get this truth from my spirit into practice in my daily life. So here's the deal. There's a difference between doing something until it works and doing something because it's right. Okay? I'm not telling you here's something we need to do until the pressure's off us financially or here's something we need to do until we have better habits. No. Exalting God's word, contradicting the devil, confessing what God's word says is true about me, that has to be applied consistently. And in doing that, you change your lifestyle. You do it because it works, not until it works. See, here's Paul talking about identification. And we're going we're gonna to close here. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. What is that? Identification. I'm, when, cross, when Christ went to the cross, I went to the cross. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So it's consistency. It's day in, day out, applying God's word, declaring God's word. When something happens in my life or a thought takes place in my heart that's contrary to that word, I contradict it. I say what God says about me, and I do that consistently. I have what God says I have. I can do what God says I can do. Let me ask you this. What are you saying about yourself? And what are you saying about your church? Does it line up with this? And if not, are you willing to contradict it? And begin to, give, begin to confess or say with God what he's saying about you. Every head bowed right now. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I just want to <clears throat> extend an invitation to pray with and for you. And two things. First of all, if, if you're here today and you'd say, Mark, this message has really struck a chord with me. I want to begin to contradict uh, the enemy contradict feelings that don't line up with God's word. And I want to begin to confess what God says about me. If that's you, just slip your hand up and slip it back down. I want to know who I'm praying with. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I got both hands up. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just pray today that you would cause us to be sensitive to what is being fed to us, what's being spoken to us, and the things that we're thinking. We, we choose today, Father, to give you our thoughts and to begin to work towards renewing our minds so that our words and our thoughts begin to line up more and more with who you say we are. We choose to identify with you and your word more than anything in this world or this life. One more prayer. If you're here today, <clears throat> And you'd say, Mark, I, I'm, I'm not too sure about this God thing. I don't have it all figured out. I, I, just, I just don't know that if when I draw my last breath in this life, I don't know that I would spend eternity in heaven. I, I, I'm, I don't think I'm right with God. I don't know that I qualify for that, but I want to. Well, that comes, friend, by you surrendering your life to Jesus and letting him be the leader, let him be the Lord. And we can do that right now by just inviting him in. Right now, all over this room, if, if you'd say, Mark, I want to know Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I want to know that my sins are forgiven. I want you to pray this in your heart after me. I'm going to say a line. You say that in your heart after me, and I'll lead you in the prayer that way. Everyone praying in their heart, say, Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. ask you to be my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of my past. Yeah, go ahead and say it out loud. Some of you are anyway. Forgive me of my past. Forgive me of my sins. Be the Lord of my life. From this day forward, as you help me, I'll surrender my life to you. Be the person you want me to be. I boldly declare that Jesus is my Savior. He went to the cross in my place, died for me, and died as me. So from this day forward, 
I'm your child. I'm born again and redeemed from sin. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me, for forgiving me, and for setting me free. Right now, with every head bowed, every eye still closed, if you prayed that prayer with me and, and, and uh, today, you prayed that prayer with me, I want you to just lift your hand. It's just you and me. Just lift your hand, catch my attention, say, yeah, Mark, I prayed that prayer with you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Anyone else? Just real quick, no one looking around. If you say, Mark, I prayed that prayer, thank you, young person. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, thank you. We just, we just bless these who are taking steps towards you. Thank you that you have met them there. Thank you that they're born again. And thank you that life is going to be different from this moment forward. Hallelujah. Can we give God praise for four people who prayed that prayer and starting their journey this morning? Amen. God bless you.